just did, there was a thousand people there. Well, that's a lot more than probably I have. Is this better lighting? No. Is it? Uh, maybe back there more. Okay. Maybe at the uh, counter. Here. I'm looking for the best. Good morning. Lighting. Good morning, everybody. Happy, uh, happy Saturday. I hope everybody is having a, a beautiful Saturday morning. I am here with my mother, uh, Maria, and we've been doing these daily conversations each and every day um, called Home Together, since we're living home together. And um, we've been talking with a bunch of different people that are out there that are trying to make a difference in uh, the philanthropic space, in the business space, um, in so many different uh, kind of areas. And we all know that it's such a hard um, economic time, such a weird time for so many people. So we've been trying to do these uh, conversations to help inspire, motivate, bring optimism to everybody. And um, today we have a very, very special guest. Well, wait a second. First, this is called the rookie and the vet now. Yeah, well today, Over yes. Here. So now we're doing every Saturday, we're doing Small Business Saturday um, to try to help people that are going through kind of tough and rough economic times. Um, last weekend we had Ed Milet, who was fantastic talked about kind of mindset, um, business, and uh, how to really pivot during this time. And today we have an amazing guest, my friend Marcus Lamona, someone that I've looked up to for years now. I've been obsessed watching with uh, him on, on CNBC. That's true. The, the Prophet, I make my mom watch it with me. I and, love it, um, actually. It's helped me learn so much uh, about business and about um, you know being a leader and everything. So Marcus has uh, said that he He's would come on. Vet. He is a extreme vet and he's going to come on here, talk to us today about kind of business, about what's happening in the world. Marcus, you did a good job. I see you requested us, so I'm going to add you right now. Already? You did he's it. requested us already? And if you guys I'm have questions, just ask, ask some questions below. We have a... a I think I'm in, right? Am oh, I there's in? Marcus. Hi, guys. Hey, Marcus. How are you? I, Marcus I, I'm looks good. I think it's interesting that your mom recognizes who the who the vet is in the situation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm excited to meet you, Marcus. Normally, I'm having to introduce Patrick to our guest, but please introduce me to Marcus. Yes, this is Marcus. I've only met Marcus two or three times, and it was me fangirling and running up to him and introducing Maria, myself. Maria, you and I have met before many, oh. many years ago um, on a Best Buddies. It was like a Best Buddies event in Miami. Uh, and Romero Brito is a friend of mine, and Romero's done a lot of stuff with him. Oh, I, I love Romero. We have Romero Brito uh, paintings here, and I saw yeah. him doing free art classes on his account. This is a great artist, uh, Romero Brito, and uh, a great friend of Best Buddies. But I'm now meeting you because I feel like I know you since we watch The Prophet all the time. I cry, I'm interested, I take notes. But Thank this you. is Patrick's show, so I'm just kind of his, no, uh, no, we've his been... fan girl. Here. Maria, it's not his show. It's your show, and you let him come on. We all know. <laughs> no, no, okay. no, no. Okay. Well, okay. first off, Marcus, thank you so much for coming yeah. on here. Uh, obviously, this is such kind of weird times for everybody, yeah. um, and including yourself, obviously. You're, you're a, a small business and a large business owner. You have um, you know, an incredible TV show. And um, we just wanted to first off check in. How are you? And um, yeah, you know, it's been a tough week for everybody. And it, I, I, you know, at the beginning of your broadcast, broadcast, you talked about Happy Saturday. And, and it's interesting, it does feel different on a Saturday than it does Monday through Friday, maybe because the news cycle is different. The noise is different. We almost are taking a deep breath on a Saturday morning. Unfortunately, the deep breath that, that I may be taking or you may be taking, our first responders are not able to take today. And so obviously, we want to give a lot of love and affection to those folks that are that are um, just putting their lives at risk and at stake to do things and um, and there are a lot of businesses that are open today at these essential businesses and so I think the primary message we want to start with today or that I want to start with today is while it may be a breath for some people today there are some people that are getting up at five in the morning and heading to the grocery store or the pharmacy to open up their business to make sure that we can eat and we need to just spread some kindness today and appreciation to those folks i know you guys do that all the time yeah, yeah. well that's that's so true i mean we've been trying to 
um, in our in our own ways support all the local um, businesses and small shops around here and uh, you know spread our thanks to everybody on the on the front lines but also the people that are like you said in the grocery store stocking the shelves the pharmacists that are out there um, the doctors the nurses our firefighters our policemen everybody's you know going uh, you know 24 7 right now so we're super thankful Um, speaking on kind of small businesses I mean, this is one of the the roughest times for, for small businesses that I can ever remember. You obviously have been through um, the 2007 financial crisis and everything. What's what's kind of your just overall advice for, for these small businesses, a lot who we have tuning in right now? I think there's a couple of issues. Um, you know, I, I don't I think that any business, small, medium or large, has ever been through something like this. I think back to the 2008-9 financial crisis where we had the debt market freeze up and the credit market frees up and we had a banking collapse. And so that, that locked things up, but it didn't shut everything down. It just, it just restricted the flow. Right now we have an open flow and nobody can do business. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest concern that I have, and I've been telling this to people all week, is that there were a lot of businesses in February, January, that weren't going to make it. And I think while, while we want to spend time providing positivity and guidance. We also want to spend time being realistic about things. And this is that moment where if you had a business or had an aspiration for a business or were operating a business that wasn't necessarily viable two months ago, I unfortunately have to tell you that the viability of that business is going to be much harder. And so as all these people are going through this uh, PPP SBA CARES Act lending program, and I I stress Mm -hmm. the word lending, it's not Mm -hmm. a gift that they have to understand the ramifications of taking on this money because it is a loan. And in most cases, if not all, the banks and the SBA are providing that to you personally, which means that you're on the hook personally. And so I think step one right now is if you have a business that you believe is viable, I'm going to need you to prove it to me. Mm-hmm. And not just with your words and your elevator pitch, I'm going to need you to prove it to me with some historical financials that that prove out your revenue thesis, your gross profit thesis, your expense thesis, and more importantly, did you make any money thesis? If you had a difficult time making money in the last couple of years, it may be the moment in time to understand how to pivot your business and more importantly, pivot yourself. Um, I was thinking the other night, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this to you, but not really, that I was laying in bed, um, you know, really sad. It was two in the morning and I was, you know, I had a bit of a vulnerable moment thinking about all the people that that have reached out for help over the years that I was not able to help and people that have reached out for help that I was able to help and now don't know if they're going to make it. Mm -hmm. And it's important to be realistic that um, we're at a time where things are going to change. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do about it. Now, the question is, how do you reinvent yourself? And, you know, I spent my whole life talking about reinvention. And I think part of the reason why The Profit was such an important platform for me to launch, because it really wasn't about business. It was about people. And it was about them reinventing themselves and finding the best of themselves. I don't know what tomorrow looks like, um, but I know there will be a tomorrow. And I don't know what next year looks like, but I know there's going to be a next year. And the question is, how do we as individuals decide what we want our role to be in that, what we want our business to be. And more importantly, owning a business isn't for everybody. Right. And it's okay. I I wrote something, I wrote something to um, a network executive yesterday about the definition of failure. And we, we all have assumed that the definition of failure is the, the absence of success. Right. I think that's sort of the opposite. For me, the definition of failure has always been, the absence of, of taking a chance and the absence of the effort. Right. And so in this moment, we're all going to fail. I've had a lot of businesses this week that I've had to make the decision that aren't going to make it. I mean, it was like, I, I didn't even know what to say to people. And the response I got was, we'll throw more money at it. It's like, uh, uh, I don't, I don't know what that means. Mm-hmm. And so as we go through this process today with the two of you, we want to, we want to shed a lot of positivity. Right. But we also want to be realistic with people about where we're at and where we're going and how we can help them. I was just looking at this document this morning of, you know, all the people that got laid off. And I haven't heard much about how we're going to explain to people how to access their unemployment, access their benefits, 
access to $1,200. I'm hearing a lot about corporate bailouts. I'm hearing a lot about small business loans, and that's good. We're going to talk about all that as well. But what's happening with the people right. yeah. that are part of those organizations? So who's doing that? I think that's really interesting, Marcus. 10 million new people applied for unemployment. Those figures came out Thursday night, and they were stunning to me. If you sit there and you think 10 million lives, 10 million families, 10 million people applying for these benefits. So I think I, you know, that's one benefit that people are applying for. So many people said, okay, I'm applying for these small business loans. Every friend of mine who has a small business is applying for that loan and it's been changing almost hourly about how to do it. Is it realistic to think that everybody who's applying is actually gonna get one? I think so, I do. And I, you know, the $350 billion that's initially allocated uh, I, unfortunately, I believe that may be a first tranche. Uh, I think the question is, what are these banks doing to put belt and suspenders around the acquisition of this money? And I'm trying to find this balance between people wanting to know how fast they can get it. And I'm also yeah. trying to balance who's actually eligible for it. And I worry about the larceny mm. that some people have in manufacturing numbers or manufacturing information to access capital that have no intent of ever opening it up. And I think right. the government realizes that the, what they're essentially doing is just flooding the market with money. Yeah. In a very weird way, Maria, in a very weird way, and I'm sure I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, but in a very weird way, this loan program is the most lucrative opportunity that small businesses have ever seen and yeah. may ever see again. Wow. $26 billion a year is lent through the SBA on an annual basis. And now all of a sudden it's 350 billion. And so a lot of companies who didn't have working capital before, but had a viable business, had some debt that they couldn't, you know, that was choking them, but had a viable business, had an invention and couldn't get a little working capital are going to get an opportunity of a lifetime if they can make it to the other side. Right. Uh, and that I think <clears throat> is, I'm looking for some silver lining and I know people get mad when I try to find silver lining all the time, but there's people that are even get money that would never have qualified. Right. Yeah. And speaking of, I mean, last night you, you, you're doing these specials on CNBC kind of about the path forward. And you've been talking about these, these uh, you know, SBA loans and, and how in the end of the day, it is a loan. And I think that what a great recommendation you did last night was, hey, all you young entrepreneurs, all you business owners, small business owners, utilize this time right now to create a business plan or to create a plan for how you're going to utilize that loan and how are you going to pay it back can you talk more about that how how people can actually yeah. use this time right now i think about it patrick if you and i were being pitched by somebody um somebody came to you and i said hey i want you to invest in my business we'd want to see financials we'd want to see some proof of concept but we'd also want to see what's called the sources and uses of things and the sources and uses are where's the money coming from and what are you going to do with it right. and i think too too often i'm hearing in the last 24 hours i just need the money i'll figure it out later it's like well wait yeah. a minute like what are you going to do with the money mm -hmm. and so if you're going to borrow five hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars one hundred thousand dollars nine million dollars i have somebody applying for a nine wow. million dollar loan and by the way the cap is 10 million yeah and the formula of their model 250% of their payroll benefits and things of that nature comes pretty damn close. Right. And so my question to them is, what are you going to do with the money? I don't know. I just want to get the money and then I'll figure it out later. And, and I can see the idea behind that because you can always give it back. You can always give it back. But much like people running to get toilet paper, don't take something you don't need. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first level of advice. Marcus, last night, I thought it was really interesting because we watched your special, as Patrick said, and you said that you think some of these employers should be thinking about when they access that loan, about giving it to some of their employees, mm -hmm. not taking it just for the business, but looking at a way that they can give it to the employees. Talk a little bit about that, because you said this is a moment for employers yeah. to really be leaders. I, I, I want, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I got a lot of comments about it. When, when, if you accessed $500,000, but your business probably needed 400,000, mm -hmm. I'm looking for people to take some percentage of this money, five, 10, 15, 20%, whatever works in the model and allocate it for employee advances. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Got it. Not yeah. gifts. Good. Because there's a taxable consequence to that gift. And right. so if you have an employee that's just been with you for three, four, five years, their performance is solid, you know the character of who they are, mm -hmm. but you can't afford to just give them the money. Right. You can, though, provide an instrument of an advance. And so if Patrick and I worked together and I worked for him and I said, listen, I'm going to take advantage of, of what I can with unemployment, what I can with my $1,200 because I don't have kids. Uh, I want to, I want to, uh, Patrick, I need a hardship advance for a thousand or $1,500. And what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to pay my rent, keep my rent on time. I know that my landlord's giving me a break, but I don't want to hurt him. I need to be able to uh, buy food for my family. And so as a business owner, I've gotten yelled at by some of my employees because they're saying to me, well, you can't just give me a loan. It's like, well, wait a second. This, this isn't a windfall for everybody. We're all, we're all taking it we're all getting compressed here. The mm -hmm. alternative is furlough. So I can pay you, you know, 30 hours instead of 40 hours or half of your wage instead of your full wage. I want you to take advantage of these programs. But if you need some extra money, let's just sit down and figure out if you need an advance, I'll give it to you. And you may be, I don't want to say morally obligated, but intelligently motivated to give them a three, four, five, six year payback plan. It's mm -hmm. not, let me give you an advance and I'm going to take it out of your first check. The right. other thing I thought on the show last night that was really good that you also said, look at, I want people to be aggressive in dealing with their landlords. We're talking right. so much about small businesses. Mm -hmm. But on the other side of that is the landlord that the small business may be renting from, the office person like myself that has a landlord. You're advocating for people to call their landlords and say, hey, can we figure this out together? Most people are reluctant to do that because they think their landlords are going to say like, no. Right. And just to go further on that, there's a lot of people commenting saying that they have kind of brick and mortar stores and they're, they're worried it just was April 1st the other day. You know, May's obviously going to be coming around the corner. How, how do they, you know, move forward with that relationship with their landlord if they can't pay that, that bill? Do they go out and talk to the landlord and say, look, man, I really need you to work with me here. I've been at this tenant for X amount of time. We're healthy. We're going to make it through this, but we need your help. It's going to sound like a bit of a conflicting message, but I'm telling people to hold on to their cash as much as they can and really understand how to prioritize how their cash is going to leave their account in one breath. In the other breath, I'm telling them to call their landlord, send an email in advance mm -hmm. of April 1st. And I, I can't blame people. I can understand how it would be scary to make that phone call yeah. because you think the landlord's going to, you know, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick you out. Right. The reality of it is, is that everybody needs to know that if you ignore your landlord and you just say nothing or you pay nothing, let's say your rent is $500 a month, to just pay zero and ignore them feels a little disrespectful to me. It would be like ignoring a customer. So I'd rather you picked up the phone and said, listen, um, I'm really scared. Um, I've been a tenant for a year, two years, five years, 10 years. I know once in a while I've been late, but I've been square up to now. I, I've, I don't owe you anything. I have zero plan in hosing you. Zero right. plan. But I'm trying to figure out how to stay alive here. And so I can send you $175 today. I'm trying to figure out ways to unlock other cash. I promise you that I just need a deferral. You can ask for an abatement. It seems like a tough request mm -hmm. to ask for just a waiver. You can ask for a deferral. And one technique that I've used in my big businesses that's worked is I've said to landlords, I need a 90 day deferral. Right. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those 90 days and I'm going to re amortize that. Right. Yes. Over a longer period of time, starting in January of 2021. Right. You got to get that. You got to get that obligation away from you for a minute. Yeah. Give you some breathing room. And you may have to pay that landlord a return on his capital. So if you are deferring $3,000, as an example, it's not unreasonable for you to offer the landlord some return on capital. So if, they, if your rent is $500 a month and now you're getting a $1,500 deferral, it's, it's not unreasonable to say to the landlord, look, you don't have the $1,500 in your hand. I'm going to pay you back $1,600. Right. Okay. Be because the landlord doesn't have that access to capital. The landlord more than likely is going to say, you know what, Patrick, thank you for being honorable, calling me. Thank you for recognizing that you're not trying to stiff me. 
You're just trying to get some help here. And why unbelievable that you're off races in most cases that landlord is going to say you know what you've been amazing don't worry about that mm -hmm. but when you show sincerity and you show humility and you show honesty your landlord's going to be more willing to work with you the same with vendors the same with employees if you just say to your employees man oh my gosh i have to furlough you today right i'm going to make it up to you i don't know how but when we get back on our feet i'm going to remember the money that i had to hold back and i'm going to try to figure out a way to get it to you I'm going to try. Right. I think that's, that's good. I, I read this article actually yesterday um, about this, um, this man who was a landlord who owned tons of different apartments and condos in New Jersey. And he did exactly that. He was actually on the landlord side and he has over 700 tenants and he had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them all and basically said, look, I know you guys have been here for this long. If you would stay with me during this, I'll give you a break during this time because I want this relationship to last for, for longer and it, it helps secure me. It helps give you breathing room. I don't want you to stress about the finances right now. Mm -hmm. And I want a married relationship for us to continue on. I think another thing that was so amazing what you talked about last night is pivoting. How important it is to kind of... Before we move on, let me give you one okay. more rent, rent thing. And I talked about it a week ago. There's this concept called blend and extend. Yes, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> and and it's, a, it's a term that, I, that people have been like, it's almost like people are like using it like it's a, like a lay person's we term. We used now. it last night, yeah. Blend yeah, no, that's great. And so what we want people to do is say to their landlord, listen, my lease is up in nine months, 12 months, 15 months, 18 months. What we know landlords ultimately want is they want the extension of the annuity. And so rent is nothing more than annuity on their asset. It's a return on capital for them. And so if you have a lease sign that, that expires in nine months, they're having to start thinking about who's going to provide that annuity for them in month 10. Mm -hmm. And so if you said to your landlord, look, for every month that you're willing to uh, uh, abate my rent, uh, reduce my rent, waive my rent or defer my rent, I'm willing to add a month onto the term of my lease. Right. I'm willing to give you something in exchange so that you can build this model that shows them that their return on capital over time, mm -hmm. over time actually is improved or at least maintained. Right. But blend and extend. So blend say, okay, I'm going to give you three extra months, right? Something similar. Right. No, that's great. Right. There's Try a lot of, a lot of people it's saying that that's great because there's so many, um, you know, small business owners that, that are worried about their rent situation. So I think that's really great advice. Um, going back to what I was saying before, kind of the pivoting and um, you know, you're, you're an owner of, or a, a partner, I should say, in so many small businesses. I mean, I think I read a stat earlier this morning that said that you injected over $35 million into small more. Okay. Than 50, whatever it is. A lot of money. A lot of money. 91. $91 million into small businesses across the United States and probably across worldwide, which is, you know, amazing first off. And, you know, the stories that we've gotten to see on the profit of you coming in and changing people's, like you said, their lives, their business. It's so, you know, beautiful to watch, but talk a little bit about the pivoting. How are these businesses pivoting? How do you recommend to pivot? Cause I mean, so many people on here I'm seeing is, uh, you know, gym owners and they have, uh, a hairstylist and uh, you know floral shops, stuff like that. How do people shift or what are you recommending to people? Especially when they've spent their entire life savings into a business that's their dream, right? It's hard to pivot. Yeah, it is hard to pivot. And, and, and unfortunately what happens is, is that they become, um, I always tease people that I don't wanna be the Gary Coleman of small business forever. And people are like, what does that mean? I'm only gonna be known for one thing. And most small business entrepreneurs have delved their whole life into being a florist or being a doctor or being a, a used car lot, whatever it may be. And they don't know anything else. Yeah. And it's scary to think like all of a sudden now I'm not gonna be in the camping business or I'm not gonna be in the pet business or I'm not gonna be in something. I don't, I don't know what other skills I have. And what I would tell people is the skills that they possess are the skills of interacting with people. That's a skill that supersedes any business idea. I don't worry about gyms long term. I don't worry about gyms long term because there's that annuity model. And I know that people are canceling subscriptions and things of that nature short term. But we're all gaining weight right now at a record pace because we're sitting <laughs> home and we're not exercising. We're making all these family meals. Tell me. 
But I think that when we talk about pivoting, I want to change the word to reinventing. Mm -hmm. Because pivot feels to me like I can just move my body a little. And in some cases, you may need to be a whole new body. And you may need to accept the fact that your, your previous career may not work. Now, if you said to me, what's one job, what's one business that I think will stand the test of time? It's really in the beauty space. Because people are still going to get their hair cut. Like my wife still is like freaking out because she can't get her hair colored. She can't get a manicure. She can't get a pedicure. And those sound like trivial things. But no matter what income bracket you're in, you need to get your hair cut. Like I cut my hair because there's not much. So I'm <laughs> saving some money right now. But, but we have to think about those industries that can survive. If you're in an industry that you believe is risky to an environment like this, you should be asking yourself on a piece of paper, make a list. What are the things I'm good at? And what are the things I'm not? Right. And start exploring those ideas. And for a short period of time, because I'm open to it, you may have to work for somebody else for a while. Mm. And that's okay. So pivoting sounds like I'm just taking and just adjusting a little bit like a chiropractor. We're, we're way beyond pivoting right now. Right. I, I think uh, women are particularly good at that, uh, at having to reinvent, whether it's uh, their kids are all grown up and they have to go back into the job market and they've been out of the job market or they're constantly having to look at the skills that they used in the home, the skills they used in carpool, the skills they used in volunteerism to apply those to the job market. But uh, Patrick has a younger brother, I have a younger son who's a senior in college and I was just talking with him and he said, you know, we're all leaving here in a month or so. The jobs that some of us had have all gone. We're going into a job market. There are no jobs. What would be the advice you have to all these college kids who are coming out of universities all across the country, who've had their senior years cut short, who are now thinking, you know, I've got to live on my own. What do we do? Where do we go? Move back home. Mm -hmm cut your expenses and intern for free somewhere and get a tryout. You know, like in okay. athletics, we all know when you can't get recruited, you walk on to the team and you right. hope that the coach sees you as a walk on and he puts you on the practice squad and you become the dummy bag intern. I would hire any college kids that wanted to get a 12 month free internship, meaning it's going to be unpaid and I would probably say to them, there's the possibility that I can bring you on. There's the possibility I can put you on 100% commission. But if I was getting out of college right now, I would be saying to any company, I'll work for free. Right. I just want to continue my education. And I'm blessed to have a mom or a dad or both or a brother or a sister that I can lay on their couch and it's not going to be glamorous and I'm not going to have a car and I'm going to have you know, not a lot of money. I'm going to have to eat ramen noodles for another year. What a great way to get a continuing education is to intern. And I, I would tell every college student in America who's, who's graduating or whatever, moving on, to, co to contact companies and say, I'll work for free. But Mark, is a lot of people at companies, you can't hire an intern for free. There's a lot of rules around interns. Myself as a company owner, there's a lot of rules that you no, can't yeah. have an intern for free. And a lot of kids can't move home their parents have taken their room and turned it into something else or their parents have downsized or their parents can't afford it. So um, are there other options or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't want to say that you can just easily start a business on Etsy and all of a sudden you're going to become a craft maker or you can be yeah. a bartender because the bars aren't open. Uh, I'm going to tell you that whatever these rules are, Maria, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, whatever these rules are around interns, We'll yeah. figure out how to pay the intern so they qualify. Maybe it's a continuing ed program. There's got to be some way that small businesses can figure out what the workaround is. Because right now, I'm going to be honest, I kind of don't care what the rules are. If a kid wants to work for yeah. me temporarily, if I own a small business and I can't afford to pay him, and he showed up and said, hey, I can't, I, I'm just here to work for free. I'd say, all right, we'll work it out. I'll defer it. I'll pay you later or something. I would come up with some solution. And I would wait for somebody to call me and say, hey, you violated uh, some sort of, I don't know what it would be. Right. Um, but there's always a way. College kids are pretty resourceful. You know that as a mom. Very. 
Yeah. That I'll go, Patrick will come sleep on my couch. I'll go sleep on his couch. A bunch of guys will, will crash in a small place and pay a hundred bucks a month in rent. I'm not worried about college kids being resourceful. What I don't want them to do is just assume that they're just on hold for right now. Right. And maybe they should go online and take some continuing ed courses or do something. If it was me, mm -hmm. I would go cut grass. I would go do yeah. landscaping. Those kind of things are still happening because there's social distancing allowed. Yeah. I would work at a car wash. I would try to go do odd jobs. I would knock on people's doors. If I had nothing, that's what I would do. I can't Good speak idea. for Good what advice. other people. I'd get my hands dirty. Right. Or I think that's so great. We pick up trash. Volunteer, it's great. I think we've seen, I, I've personally seen in so many of our small businesses, um, students or young, you know, men and women that come in and do something like you just said, saying, hey, I'll work for you for free for these months. I'm going to show you that I'm going to prove myself that I'm there to, to do everything in the best way possible. And actually, we did an interview the other day with Bethany Frankel, who said yeah. that exact thing, that she was, the only job she could get was an intern as a PA. And she had, she didn't want to do anything in the film industry at the time. And she went and she said, I'm going to do the best PA job that anyone's ever done. And you guys are going to hire me and you'll see. And she built her way up. So I think that that's great advice. Um, look, Marcus, it's 10 o'clock. We don't want to keep you any longer. Yeah, we do. We do. Yeah, we, we do. do. But I'm we... good. I got time if you got time. So we got a couple more. I'm not any, I, gotta, I don't have to go anywhere. I'm good. Let me just ask you, Marcus, um, so many nonprofits, they're not, quote, they don't come under the small business category, but in many ways they are small businesses. And so many of my friends, myself included in nonprofits saying, you know, they can't raise money now. Uh, they're also firing people. Um, what's your advice? Is your advice to nonprofits the same as small businesses? Cut yeah, your expenses. I was, I was pretty sure that I saw in the document that nonprofits were eligible to apply. Were they not? Did I yes. That wrong? Yes, they are. Yes, yeah. they are. They're eligible to apply, and that's going to solve some short-term problems. The, the, the fear that I have right now is as all of us are pulling back and spending less, yeah. we know that the arts programs, the music programs, the, the, the theater programs, they're going to be on lockdown. And so I do worry about that. But when I take a step into more relevant nonprofits, profits that are taking care, nonprofits taking care of seniors or disabled or kids with disabilities, I do worry about where their funding is going to come from. And it is going to take the super wealthy, no matter what they want to say, it is going to take the super wealthy to dip into their pocket to keep these types of organizations involved and, and alive. I always tell people that you got to run your nonprofit the same as a business. You got to look at your operating expenses. You got to look at your money that's leaving the system. But I'm worried about how much money's coming in, Maria. I am. Yeah, so am I. I do. <laughs> Yeah. I really am worried about it. Yeah. You said last night on the show that you're really worried about the restaurant business yeah. overall and the hospitality business overall. Many people saying to me, like people my age, I'm not going back to a restaurant until they get a vaccine for this. Are you, uh, when you say you're really worried about hospitality, are you worried that hotels will come back, that restaurants will come back in any form? I think they will. I mean, if you go back and you look at 2008 and 2009, we all said that there was a lot of things we wouldn't do again. And then we had amnesia right. and we repeated the error of our ways. <clears throat> I worry about uh, people that have events businesses, like putting on weddings yeah. or putting on, you know, uh, yeah. large concerts or things of that yeah. nature. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know when that happens. I think restaurants are going to learn to pivot. In fact, prior to the shutdown, people were, you know, if you can have 20 tables, you now have to have 10. If you were allowed to have 50 people, you now have to have 10. I think that's fine in the short term, but I don't think it's going to work long term. We are going to see a consolidation in the restaurant business. We are going to see that if there was, as an example, 10,000 restaurants before, when we come out of this, there's probably going to be, you know, some some number significantly less than that. We already know that restaurants are one of the hardest things to keep open yeah. when yeah. things are normal. Um, and so I don't know where all those servers and those bartenders and the, and the, the kitchen crew and the staff, I don't know where they go. Um, and I think that we're, they're gonna have to try to find other jobs in the similar service industry. I think hotels will be okay. It's odd because my primary business, as you guys know, is camping. And so that's how, right. you know, that's sort of my primary thing. And in a weird way, the camping business is probably going to be the business that will be one of the biggest benefactors of all this because it provides distancing, it provides family time, you can go out into the outdoors, you can do activities. 
But if I was in the concert business, the airline business, the cruise ship business, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I think I think our life has changed forever. Really For does. sure, there's there's no. We're not going back to what was. We're moving forward. Most important thing yeah. to know is we're moving forward. What that will look like, we don't know exactly. So maybe we'll check back in with you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, to let me out. let me just tell you one. Let me tell you one last thing before we go. Um, you know, with all the doom and gloom that's out there, it's hard to watch the news. And with, with us just dosing a bit of reality for 20 minutes, it is important to know that, that I have a, a, a probably the most optimistic view of our future. Me too. And I try not to, I try not to put it out on the street because I don't want people to get um, almost complacent that, okay, it's going to be okay. Yeah, right. it is going to be okay. I'm, I'm living in this world and I want you guys to do the same where we balance this ray of sunshine and hope because we know we're going to be okay. We're going to love each other. We're going to take care of each other. We're going to become closer than ever with this realistic approach that things are going to be difficult for a minute. They just are. Yeah. And, and I'm watching and I've been a uh, part of what made me cry the other night in bed is I'm watching employees and big and small businesses across the country take pay cuts Right. to give it to somebody else. Take their vacation time and give it to somebody else. And I've had employees in big and small businesses write checks out of their personal accounts the same day that they're getting terminated to other people that are a single mom of two, uh, uh, wow. a, a young man taking care of his mom or dad. And I think that karma is playing a really weird role in this whole process where good people are realizing that their good deeds, their selfless right. acts, may go unnoticed in the media, but they won't go unnoticed to their faith. They right. won't go unnoticed by their neighbor and they won't go unnoticed by their kids. Mm. And the biggest message is your kids are watching you right. and they're watching how you're behaving and your kindness and your generosity will, will leave a lasting impression because they'll remember the virus and your kindness. And I want us to stamp on our young kids today that, that kids will be reading about this in the history books for years. They're going to remember the kindness more than they're going to remember the virus. I it's couldn't promised. agree with you more, Marcus. And I think I, I actually was just writing in my Sunday paper for tomorrow, listening to my dad talk about his family losing everything in the Depression and how that forged his character and launched him into a life of service on behalf of people who lost everything. Uh, characters are being forged. Uh, reinventions are happening. Empathy is front and center. Kindnesses after years of constant reports of division and anger. Um, good is rising. Uh, I think it's really important to remember also that there's tremendous grief, tremendous pain, tremendous right. heartache. Uh, and and tremendous all, love. And tremendous love. And I was going to say all of these stories are being held and are coexisting. And so um, there is much to uh, you know, to Harold, and there is much pain uh, going on in families uh, all across this country. And Maria, so I want to I want to just tell you something, and I know um, that your son and I are connected, but I want to compliment you um, as a mom. You know, I lost my mom many years ago, and I want to compliment you as a mom because you're not only a mom to wonderful kids, but to a lot of people, they rely on your advice as a mom. Thank and you. they rely on your advice. And you have always set an amazing example for all of us. And, you know, it's funny. I was telling my wife that we were going to be doing this this morning. And she said to me, oh, you know what? I always feel like Maria is a ray of hope and sunshine. And I said, yeah, she's also a ray of reality, too. And she's, yeah. and I want to compliment you and thank you for being a great leader for, for us kids <laughs> and for other parents that are out there. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Yeah. That just made my day. And uh uh, yeah, my, uh, my greatest work uh, is my children, right? My greatest hope. And as I Who's said- Who's your I, favorite kid? And don't uh, favor all your favorites. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that silly. I'm not yeah. that silly. But I'm so blessed, right, with my children and uh, with the life I have. And um, I think it's, uh, it's a blessing to be able to get up every day and offer uh, hope and that people take it and- tell you back that it means something to them. And I think that's why we're all here. We're all here to be of service. And that's why I've loved watching The Prophet with Patrick, because as you said, there's so many human stories in there. I've cried 
so many times watching yeah, your show. Me you know, too. Watching your show, the what the story about the the family where the the, um, the mom died shop. in uh, 9 11 and yeah, they got the uh, grant and the family and working together. There's so many stories. And that's why when I see these figures and as a journalist behind 10 million people filing for unemployment, there are lives, there are families, there are stories. And um, that's what your show does is it brings us not just into the business, but into the lives of these people. And that's why I think you're so successful and um i think we all have a chance now through social media and other to bring you know lives front and center mm -hmm. stories of hope and inspiration and pain and agony and all together and so thank you so much for uh, being the vet in this conversation <laughs> for us rookies here there's two there's two episodes that uh, people ask me all the time i've never seen the show i've done over 100 episodes wow. what episode should i watch there's two episodes that i always tell people um, and they're actually kind of recent that I think will will be good in these times. One is um, I did an episode on a town in uh, downstate Illinois on the Mississippi River that actually. Oh, wow. Started. That one was wild. And, uh, and, and the reason that I did that is because I wanted to prove to people that it doesn't take money to fix things. I watched this town that was 34 feet underwater and we rebuilt it over four months. And I watched them figure out how to solve the problem for themselves. And so it, I think it's a yeah. good testament to you don't need Marcus or Patrick or Maria to solve your problems. Yeah. You may want to talk to them, but you can do it yourself. And so Grafton, Illinois was an episode yeah. that, that uh, I should watch, people should watch. And the second was, was um, a story that I did uh, reluctantly. I did the network had me go back to where I was born. They were, I went back right. to Lebanon yeah. and uh, it really talks about the privilege of being an American and, and, while we're frustrated today that the SBA isn't moving fast enough and the government isn't doing enough and this isn't happening, we got to take a little breath here and realize that yeah. we are living the greatest country in the world. Right. And while we have our, our deficiencies as individuals and as a country, we have a lot more things to celebrate. And so I want people to remember that as bad as things are today, and they're, they're going to get they're going to get worse for the next couple of weeks. Like, I'm not here to tell you everything's going to be fine. They're going to get worse. We got to keep remembering that there are, um, there's a lot of good things out there. And right. maybe in the future, you can go into the federal government and figure out how to get ventilators and masks for the future. And figure out how their, their processing department isn't working. And that's a good job for you. <laughs> I know. It's a, the profit it's government I it. I edition. Like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Well, listen, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Marcus. Thank, thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We'll thank talk to you, you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Wait, I just turned myself around. There we go. All right. Well, thank you guys so much again for uh, tuning in. He was terrific. He was really great. We've done back-to-back -back, uh, weekends of really great um, business leaders. Last week being Ed Milet. This week, Marcus Limonis. Um, and I think that there were so many takeaways. I know we had hundreds of questions on here. Hopefully, we got to get to a lot of your guys's um, about you know being landlords or being tenants, um, how to get to the MBA loans, um, how to when once you do have that that money, how There's to. There's Eric Budabaugh. Yes. Has a flower shop, so maybe some of the information. Yeah, he talked he about a floral closes. floral um, flower shop. Flower yeah. shop but really to utilize this time right now to create that plan so that if you are applying for those loans, you know exactly what it is you're wanting to do once that money comes in, <clears throat> how to really treat your employees, make sure you carve out a, um, a section of that money for your employees. They're the ones that are really lifting up your company and uh, doing all the hard work. So make sure you, you know, keep them in your thoughts and mind. Um, if you guys are tenants, Marcus said how to approach your landlord have honest, open conversations with them um, and really just be vulnerable and tell them the situation you're in. Um, what other takeaways did you have? And for your family, I, I loved what he said that uh, your kids are paying attention to how you navigate this time. Right. You're a leader of uh, a, a, a community as a parent and that that's really important. Uh, I loved that. And we're gonna get through this. It is gonna be painful. 
But uh, I thought it was interesting that he said he thought the beauty business was in a way best situated <laughs> to come out of this. I thought some, some people gyms. said Botox and, <laughs> you know, uh, all those kinds of things. But I think it's a reset moment for those of us who are in the nonprofit business, those of us who have small businesses. We've got to take really hard looks at should we continue? Should we reinvent? Right. Um, how best to do that? And so there's a lot of, I think, soul searching going on. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity. You know, I was saying last right. night, maybe we should go into the mask business. Uh, there's going to be a need. All of us need to be wearing masks. So some companies, there's a young woman who um, has an apron business and she turned into the mask business. Right. Um, so really think about, like Marcus said, not pivoting, but reinventing. How are you going to shift so that you can survive? And, you know, oh, yeah, and Wanda saying, you know, get you your hands dirty. I thought his advice to college students right. was great. Right. Uh, come out, you know, land on your parents' couch if you can, and go and get your hands dirty. Right. So, guys, a lot of you are asking that you came in a little bit late and everything. If we're going to post this on YouTube, uh, I am going to post this. I'm going to save this video. I'm going to put it on my story, and then I'm going to put the link to the YouTube so that you can continue to watch this. That sounds fancy. Um, that's very fancy. Uh, so you can watch it later today, tomorrow, anytime that you want. I was kind of dark in this video. I know. I we have to figure to out get, the lighting. I was trying to get a <coughs> flashlight to flash myself uh, during the thing. No, but it's I couldn't fine. see the. But anyways, thank you guys for tuning in. We will continue for the rest of the week going back onto my mom's Instagram live doing a we session have John called bon Jovi. Home Together. This week we have, yeah, John Bon Jovi, which will be huge. We have Gavin Newsom. Governor Gavin Newsom of California. Chef Andreas. Chef Andreas, which I'm so excited to, to uh, speak with him. He's done so much for uh, everybody, for America, for the world, um, you know, providing meals and food for so many people in need. And he's just always on the front lines during hurricanes, during tornadoes, during economic crises, during anything. So Chef Andreas, I'm extremely excited to talk with. We have Glennon Doyle, who's going to talk also about Finding Your Truth and her incredibly best-selling book oh, yes. and what she's doing on behalf of families who are struggling. We have incredible people. Simon Sinek, I think, might be doing next week. Next we'll Saturday. Be vet, Simon uh, Sinek, that's optimism. who we're hoping for. Yes. And uh, if you guys missed any of ours from this last week, please go on. Suggestions, yeah, if you have uh, suggestions. Yeah, if you have suggestions. That's true. And if you want to watch the past episodes, I'll also have the link for the YouTube. We had an amazing uh, week this week with Guy Fury, who was amazing yes, and helping wonderful. out so many of the employees at Sanjay restaurants. Gupta had a lot Sanjay of... Gupta was really, really good. Patrick is the new Anderson Cooper. Patrick. Wow, uh, okay. you're really reinventing. Gotta, gotta change my hair and my beard and <laughs> yeah, everything. Gotta but, look uh... straight into the camera. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you guys. Have a great weekend. Bye. Have a great Saturday. God bless. Stay optimistic. And um, we will talk to you soon. God bless.